We welcome our YouTube visitors to our service of worship here at Berkeley Congregational Church. And I'm going to ask John to please come up and read the intimations. Thanks, John. <coughs> Thank you, Jeff, and good morning to all you people, especially those that are uh, watching us on uh, YouTube. Welcome to our service this morning. And we're going to be celebrating communion during the course of our service. And then we continue to pray for uh, all our church family who are struggling in various areas of health, uh, spiritual, financial, and any other problems. And we ask you especially to, to pray for for Jeanette, uh, who had a fall recently and is recovering, Jeff has just mentioned that, um, and we just pray that her, her recovery will be quick and swift. And then a final reminder for the Seniors Fellowship Group that we're meeting this Thursday here uh, in the Long Hall uh, at 10 a.m. in the morning. And then I was very privileged yesterday to be able to attend the uh, 20th birthday celebration of the Westlake United Church uh, Trust um, in, in Westlake. And uh, they put on a magnificent meeting there and also breakfast. Now, I was fortunate to get there just in time for, for breakfast. <laughs> and I was a bit late, but... <laughs> uh, and they, we've, we've got a certificate of special res re recognition. We actually founded members of the Trust and we've been contributing for the last 20 years. Uh, and uh, they, gave, they gave us this, so um, it's actually, and there was such a, a wonderful peace and joy and just fellowship, you know, when, when, when people get together uh, of the same faith like, uh, like we did yesterday. Um, and it, it's, it's actually amazing, um, you know, we have the same things in common and all that sort of thing, especially our faith. And uh, I was able to speak to uh, Eleanor, who was the, uh, you perhaps remember uh, Brenda, um, Eleanor was the principal of the, the little school there. And uh, it has now has 150 children. And she retired about uh, six years ago. And Hazel has taken over, not this Hazel, the other Hazel. Hazel, uh, Hazel has taken over. And uh, yeah, it's, it's fantastic what the, the work that the Trust has done over, over the years. So that was, that was fantastic. And um, I think that's all I have to say. Yeah, uh, and our verse for the week is a, wor a word especially for those folk that need encouragement because they're going through difficult times. And it's in Psalm 57. <laughs> And we read the first two verses. Psalm 57, verses 1 and 2. <coughs> Have mercy on me, O God. Have mercy on me. For in my soul, in you my soul takes refuge. I will take refuge in the shadow of your wings until the disaster has passed. And this is the word of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. And in our prayers of, for our prayers of intercession, I'm going to hand over to Sir Edmund. Thank you, John. Morning, everybody. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, you are the God who is ever creating, the God who is ever loving, and the God who is ever leading. We turn to you in prayer, trusting in your steadfast love, Whenever people are anxious about the future, overwhelmed by their responsibility, or worried because of the upheavals in their lives, bring peace and hope, we pray. God of all compassion, we turn to you and pray where people are lonely or isolated, longing for love, where people are tra trapped in unhealthy relationships, or facing violence each day, where people are grieving the loss of routine or purpose in their lives, or the loss of someone beloved. Bring courage and hope, we pray. 
God of tender strength, we turn to you and pray where people feel pain in their bodies, in their minds or spirits, where people seek help, healing or help, where illness has eroded hope and desperation fills each day. Bring healing and hope, we pray. God of truth, we turn to you and pray where leaders work to guide the world and their communities to a better life, where professionals discern scientific, medical and economic insights to protect and restore the quality of life, where individuals still strive to care for the earth and its vulnerable inhabitants. Bring wisdom and hope, we pray. God, in whom by your Holy Spirit we live and move and have our being, strengthen us admit, admit the current struggles we face, where hope flickers, reunite its power, shine the light of Christ's love into each life, and renew our trust in you as we pray together in the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. I now hand over to Brandon for the reading of the word. Good morning all. Today's reading, John chapter 14, verses 1 to 31. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am coming there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, Don't you know me, Philip, even after I've been among you such a long time? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing. And they will do even greater things than these, because I am going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. If you love me, keep my commands. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The Spirit of Truth, 
The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in the Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. Then Judas, not Judas Iscariot, said, But Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus replied, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. All this I have spoken while still with you. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the followers will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. You heard me say, I am going away and I am coming back to you. If you love me, you would be glad that I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. I have told you now, before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe. I will not say much to you, for the Prince of the world is coming. He has no hold over me, but he comes so that the world may learn that I love the Father and do exactly what my Father has commanded me. And this is the word of God. Thank you. Thanks, Brad. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we come to this, the sharing of your word, we pray that the words of my mouth, the meditation of our hearts, will be acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength, our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. I want to start this morning's sermon with a question. Uh, how do you feel saying goodbye uh, so to someone or a group especially a group that you're very close to and you know that you might never see them again um, I don't know how you react but it, it tears me up inside with over this last year we've had to say goodbye to the two of our children and their families as they've gone overseas you know I, I don't know about you but to try and stop myself from becoming too emotional at the time, I tend to become all business-like <laughs> and try and take a step back, you know, uh, and keep breathing, you know. Uh, sometimes I can do it, sometimes I can't. You just have to face up to it, you know. But it, I, 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 I get very emotional. One of my worst experiences of, of goodbyes was leaving my very first church at which I was minister. That's... St. Mark's Presbyterian Church in Yeovil, Johannesburg. It was our first church and Sir Ridman and I uh, loved that church. They were very good to us, very, very good to us, not like some other churches. <laughs> they, they were a fabulous congregation, fabulous. And um, they, uh, they were good to us and our family and as a congregation, 
They allowed Saridwin and us to grow. They gave us the freedom, you know, to grow in our ministry. We had lots of friends there, and we, we've stayed in contact with many of them. Some, when they come to Cape Town, come in and pop in and see us. But others are all over the world, Australia, New Zealand, I was talking about the Shetland Islands and America, England, Holland, Canada, and we stay in touch with them by, by email. It, it, it's lovely, but they arranged a farewell tea for us. And there was between three and four hundred people at that farewell tea. At that, and, uh, and as they far past, we, we said goodbye. Oh. I knew it was time to leave. I knew it was the right time to leave. Um, I, I knew that I, I had to carry on in a different place doing ministry. And I knew that God had called us here into Cape Town and Claremont. But I cried my eyes out saying goodbye. What made it worse, I knew that there were certain people I would never see again who I was very close to. The one person especially was our organist. Uh, a, a Hollander named Case Hoovers. Now Case and his wife Aline ran the choir and Case was a director of companies. Uh, he'd been so honoured uh, that he'd been um, what we would call the equivalent of knighted by uh, Queen Beatrice. Uh, he was a good man, a great organist. The church choir loved him and he drew the best from them. And, but Case had advanced cancer and we knew that we would never see each other again. Oh, we just cried and cried and cried. I get emotional just thinking about it, you know. We clung to each other and four months later, Case died. Saying goodbye is not easy. It's not easy, no matter what the situation. And when we get to this part of the Gospel of John, Jesus has been saying goodbye. He's, he starts right back in, in chapter 12, uh, but and then through verse 13, he, he starts saying goodbye, first of all, to Mary and Martha and Lazarus. Then he travels for the last time into Jerusalem. Remember, he goes from uh, Bethany to uh, Bethpage and then down through the Kidron Valley and up into Jerusalem. And he stays at a place, um, at the home of Mark, the man who wrote Mark's Gospel. He stays in his mother's home there and he eats there and he shares the the last meal there and uh, while he's there he's saying goodbye all the time uh, he arranges a meal to be served which we call the last supper and uh, which we celebrate today called holy communion coming together as the communion the, the community of christ coming together and sharing in this holy meal well this is where it starts, as Jesus is saying goodbye. He said, you've heard of the Old Testament? Well, this is the new covenant. In the Old Testament, there was that covenant. This is the new one. And it's by my body and blood. And this is what we're going to celebrate. But, but here we come to one of the great mysteries of, of the New Testament. It is a mystery for me. Uh, because the Last Supper... It could easily be called the farewell supper. Uh, it's uh, because in John's gospel, it's not the Passover meal. Did you know that? In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it is the Passover. It is the Passover. Jesus goes and celebrates the Passover. Not John. I just wonder who's right. Uh, if for John, it seems to be more of what is called a, a fellowship meal, a kubura meal. Um, uh, see, the other Gospels, as I say, have him celebrate the Passover, then being arrested, tried and crucified, then taken down from the cross so as not to defile the Sabbath. But according to John, Jesus dies at three o'clock on the day of the Passover, which starts at six o'clock that evening. And, uh, and so, so 
which is three hours later. Jesus dies at three o'clock in the afternoon, which is the time that the Passover lambs are being slaughtered in the temple to share that evening in the Passover meal. For John, Jesus is the, is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Jesus is our Passover lamb who gives his life a ransom for many. Now, according to John, the meal Jesus had with his disciple is not the Passover. Uh, it's a, as I say, I, I wonder who is right. I wonder who is right. John or Matthew, Mark, Luke. Then he comes to his second act of saying goodbye. He does something which I find wonderful. He gives his people an example by which to live. He takes a cloth and he takes a bowl and he then washes his disciples' feet. And he's, it's, it's an act of love and he says, if you want to be my disciples, I want you to love one another as I have loved you. You call me master. And this is what your master is doing for you. Go and do it for other people. And he tells his disciples that unless they are willing to do that same, they have no part in his ministry. Unless we are caring for one another and feeling pain and hurt, love and excitement for one another, then we're not part of his discipleship, his disciples. And then in the next part of saying goodbye, Jesus says something special. He says, I'm going away, but I'm going to... I'm going to leave you a gift. And this is basically what I, I want to speak about today. He says that it, it's a gift of his presence as they're about to make a journey into faith and ministry on their own. It, it's a, the gift of the presence of the Holy Spirit, whom Jesus calls the Parakletos, which can mean advocate. As, it was, as Brandon read for us, or the comforter, or the counsellor, some people call it. But what it means is someone who stands by your side and walks with you, just as an advocate or a counsellor would, or someone who is comforting you would. They stand by your side and they walk with you. And, and there's been much rubbish written and preached about the Holy Spirit since the beginning of the century, especially since the 60s. And because of it, many Christians are confused about the Holy Spirit. I'd like just to point out four things about this goodbye gift that Jesus has given to us, his church. And the first one is that the, without the Holy Spirit, the church is nothing. Remember, it is nothing. You know, it's just a gathering of people. Just as the tabernacle in the Old Testament is just an empty tent until the cloud covers it and the glory of the Lord fills it, so the church is an empty edifice. It's nothing but brick and stone where people meet until the Holy Spirit is here, until the Lord fills it with the people who are filled with His Holy Spirit. With the coming of the Spirit of Pentecost, the Lord was filling a new temple, not one of skins and tapestries or bricks and mortar, it, or it, but of people, people committed to Jesus Christ. You are the church, not this building. You are the church. And you are filled with the Holy Spirit because the Spirit of God is with you. You know, it was the great American writer and the Anglican writer, theologian, John Stott, who is a fabulous writer. Please, if you ever get a chance, buy his books and read them or listen to them. He said this, Before Christ sent the church into the world, he sent the Holy Spirit into the church. The same order must be observed today. Isn't that beautiful? 
the Reverend Andrew Murray, someone who is in this country so well known, uh, said the greatest need of the church and the thing which above all others believers ought to seek for with one mind and with their whole heart is to be filled with the Spirit of God. Second, the presence of the Holy Spirit in a person's life is the personal presence of Jesus with them. The Holy Spirit is God with us. It is Jesus with us. The, the personal presence of Jesus meant so much to the disciples. Without him, they were nothing. Think of the times when they were lost or afraid because Jesus wasn't with them. The storm on the Sea of Galilee. The time they tried to heal the boy when Jesus was away up the mountain of transfiguration with Peter, James and John. Or on the day of the resurrection, before Jesus revealed themselves, they were locked away in a room, scared. Jesus' presence with them was the blessing to them. They felt strong, they felt confident, they felt authoritative when he was around. And as he was leaving, he says this, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate another counselor another comforter to be with you forever the spirit of truth this the world cannot accept him because it neither sees him or knows him but you know him for he lives with you and will be in you i will not leave you as orphans i will come to you the counsellor, the comforter, the advocate is nothing other than the person of Jesus, the spirit of Jesus in our lives. The presence of Jesus in our ongoing ministries for him. The Holy Spirit isn't some kind of impersonal force of energy. It is God in Christ with his people. It is God with you. It is God with me as we go forward day after day in the wonderful name of Jesus that we carry Christian we are the church and God whatever ministry or life or walk God has set before us the paracletos the one who stands by our side goes with us third the Holy Spirit works to point people not to us but to Jesus. This is one of the great faults of the church today. If you look at so much of the church, when they say that they are spirit-filled, the problem is they, they want people to look to them being filled with the Spirit. But it isn't. It is the Holy Spirit always points us to the Lord. Whatever we do is to bring Him glory, not us glory. It is for Him. He, the work of the Spirit is to point people to Jesus. I, I think James Packer in his book, Your Father Loves You, puts it beautifully. And I'm just going to read this to you. I remember walking to church one winter evening to preach on the words, He will glorify me. The Holy Spirit will glorify me. From John 16, 14. Seeing the building floodlit as I turned a corner, I realised that this was exactly the illustration my message needed. When floodlighting is well done, the floodlights are placed so that you do not see them. In fact, you're not supposed to see where the light is coming from. What you are meant to see is just the building on which the floodlights are trained. The intended effect is to make it visible when otherwise it would not be seen for the darkness and to maximize its dignity by throwing all its details into relief so that you can see it properly this perfectly illustrates the spirit's new covenant role he is so to speak the hidden spotlight shining on the savior i think of it this other way it is if the spirit stands between us throwing light over our shoulder onto Jesus who stands before us the Spirit's message is never look at me listen to me come to me 
get to know me, but always look to him, see his glory, listen to him, hear his word, go to him and have life, get to know him and taste his gift of joy and peace. The spirit, we might say, is the matchmaker, the celestial marriage broker, whose role it is to bring us and Christ together and to ensure that we stay together. <coughs> Finally, the Holy Spirit is the power of Jesus Christ in you and me. Without Jesus by their side, the disciples were powerless. With him, they had power to work miracles, to heal, to save, to preach, to go out with boldness and with courage. And the Holy Spirit's continued promise is that it is with us in divine power. The power of the church is to do wonderful things for Jesus Christ. I believe that has waned. And, uh, and uh, over the last few centuries, and, and I, I blame it on the church, I blame it on the theologians in the church. You know, those people that tear, who, who proclaim to be Christ, are Christians, and tear the Bible to pieces. Those who claim to be Christ and, de and deny the divinity of Christ are uh, Christians. And those who claim to be Christians and, and, and deny the miraculousness of his ministry. But in these last few centuries, uh, uh, decades, sorry, decades, uh, it, it's been wonderful to see what God has been doing. And what he is doing, he's doing a new thing as he pours out his spirit on all flesh. Somebody gave me an illustration of the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Maybe it will help you. He said this, a wild rose is nothing but a wild rose. Whatever you do to it, it can only produce wild roses. If you want to produce high quality blooms, you have to graft in a rose of higher quality than the wild rose. For us to produce a life of higher quality, we can only do so if we are infused with the higher life than our own. That is Christ's life. This is the filling of the Holy Spirit. Yes, Jesus is saying goodbye. He says goodbye to Mary, Martha, Lazarus that night. He says goodbye to his disciples in a wonderful act of, of, of servanthood. He washes their feet. He gives them a meal. A meal that we'll be celebrating in a moment. As a reminder of who he is. It's his goodbye meal. His farewell meal. And then he gives them the blessing of something else. The Holy Spirit. What a wonderful gift. Let's thank him for his presence. Let us pray. O oh, Holy Father, gracious God, you pour out your spirit upon us. You anoint us with your love. You, you hold us together by the power of the Holy Spirit. It is the binding force that unites the church and it is the power that will raise us to life on the day of resurrection. Pour out your spirit into us, your believers, dear Jesus, dear Father. Pour out your spirit that we, filled with that spirit, might go out in the name of Jesus and bring him glory. We ask it. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. We're now going to celebrate Holy Communion. Would the, the two deacons please come forward?
An invitation is given to any member of Christ Church who may so desire to come and share with us in this wonderful meal. Because it does not belong to us, it belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray. O oh, Holy Spirit, we ask that you would come down upon these elements of bread and wine and make them for us a sharing in the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. We ask that you come down upon us and make us receptive to your word, to your spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come among us and bless us. And as we separate this from all common use and mystery, we ask, Lord, may it bring you glory. Amen. And so we do this in remembrance of him who, on the night of his betrayal, took bread. And after giving thanks, he blessed it and said, This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way after supper, he took the cup. And after giving thanks, he blessed it and said, This is the cup of the new covenant sealed by my blood. Whenever you drink it, do so in remembrance of me. For every time we eat of this bread and we drink from this cup, we remember the death of our Lord till he comes again. The body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is broken for you. Feed on him with thanksgiving in your heart. Dear Jesus, we thank you. We thank you that you came to us. The incarnation, the coming into flesh. We thank you that you, our God, walked among us. That you lived among us. That you worked among us. And then when the time was right, you turned your face towards Golgotha, the cross. And you went there and you died for us. Dear Jesus, we thank you that you became like us, that we might become like you. Fill us with your presence every moment of every day. We ask it in thy name. Amen. The blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was shed for you. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your blood shed upon the cross for us. That shedding of blood in which we find the forgiveness of our sin. Dear Heavenly Father, help us to come to you humbly Acknowledging that without a Saviour we are lost. Acknowledging that we need your Holy Spirit presence with us to empower us, to make us worthy of our calling as Christians. And one day, when the time, our time comes to raise us up to be with you, we ask all of this in and through the name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Receive the blessing. May God the Father bless you. Christ take care of you. The Holy Spirit enlighten you all the days of your life. The Lord be your defender of body and of soul, now and forever. Amen.